Greetings AP Calculus AB students, Mr. Record here taking a look at video number three over topic 5-6. It's going to cover example one, part C. This is the one we led up to here in the last couple of videos where we're going to be looking at a very challenging function and we're going to use the test for concavity to find its intervals of concavity and its point of inflection. So let's just take a look at how bad this guy is. The directions once again read typically determine the open intervals on which each graph here is concave upward or downward and state the points of inflection. Well as you can see our function is a little bit leaner and meaner here. It's going to require the quotient rule in order to take the first derivative and then who knows what it's going to require for the second derivative. So I'll tell you what I'm going to make sure I have enough space. I'm going to start the first derivative up here. So we use the quotient rule and we get the derivative of the numerator times the denominator. We know to subtract the numerator and then we'll multiply by the derivative of the denominator and place this all over the denominator squared. So it could look something like that before we do some simplifying. I do want to point out for those of you who are thinking about rewriting the original function so that the x squared minus 4 is located in the numerator with a negative 1 exponent. You could certainly do that. Then you could use the uh, product rule and it works really nicely. In fact, there is some argument to be made that that might even be a little bit easier, uh, but I would let you guys decide on what's best for you all. Now, in this particular problem, I'm going to continue to simplify here. So if I multiply through by the 2x, I would get 2x cubed minus 8x minus 2x cubed minus 2x all over x squared minus 4. And what this would eventually do is simplify to where the numerator is merely a 10x and the denominator would be x squared minus 4 quantity squared. And that's about where I would leave it before embarking on our second derivative, which I'm going to do here in black. So let's do derivative number two. Again, we'll use the product or, or the quotient rule. Derivative of the top is negative 10. Multiply that by the bottom. We subtract the top. And I tell you what, in the process of subtracting negative 10x, we can make that pretty easy on ourselves and add 10x. And then when we multiply by the derivative of the denominator, the two would come out in front. x squared minus four is raised to the first. Don't forget that all important chain rule, multiply by 2x. And now our denominator is going to be x squared minus 4 all to the fourth power. As you can see, we have some cleaning up that we can do. So I'm going to combine some things that I can combine in the second grouping of terms here in the numerator. So I don't really have much to do with this first piece, this first term, but 10x times 2 times 2x is a 40x squared, and then I can multiply that by my x squared minus 4 to the first, all divided by x squared minus 4 to the fourth. Now, as I slowly maneuver this towards a better simplified state, I can then factor out the common factor in the numerator. That is going to consist of, of course, a negative 10. And as we talked about in the previous video, you can always bring out the lowest powered binomial. And that would be a first power, x squared minus 4 to the first. That would leave me with x squared minus 4 to the first minus a 4 to bring out of the 40. And then an x squared, close my bracket. The denominator is still x squared minus 4 to the 4th. And by the time we see that we can reduce here, combine some like terms, the numerator might consist of negative 10 times the quantity negative 3x squared minus 4 all over x squared minus 4 to the 3rd. And one last thing I might suggest, we could factor out a negative and that tends to clean up this numerator just a little bit more even. And so 
we're going to call that our best looking second derivative. In fact, I don't want to lose track of him. I'm going to highlight him in yellow and denote that this is my second derivative. Now we get to find critical numbers. So let's go ahead and make that happen. I'm going to switch back to blue ink. We are going to determine when does f double prime of x equal 0. And how about when does f double prime of x be undefined? Now we have a bit of an unusual circumstance here. It's one of the reasons why I like this example. If we try to set the numerator equal to 0, which will always address the question when the derivative is 0, we only need to know when the numerator is 0. By the time we divide the 10 over, if you subtract the 4, divide by 3, you might find yourself looking at this, which means that has no solution in the real number system. Normally, in some previous examples, we saw that that came about from setting the denominator equal to 0. But in this case, if you were to set the denominator equal to 0, the x squared minus 4 quantity cubed equals 0, by the time you cube root both sides, you see x squared minus 4 is 0, you will be well on your way to determining that 2 and negative 2 are the results of that particular equation. Now we can go into our number line and place our values within it. That would be a negative 2 and a positive 2. And we are going to concern ourselves with figuring out what is the sign of f double prime. And that will lead us to determine what is the behavior of f. So if you start plugging in some numbers like, say, negative 3, and I'm going to use my highlighted version, we get 10 times, well, it really seems like anything that we plug into the numerator is going to be positive, right? I don't even want to worry about working it out because it's going to be a pretty large number in the numerator. And then the denominator, by the time we plug negative 3 in for x and square it, 9 minus 4 is going to be 5. That cubed is still positive. So we feel very confident that we have a con down situation on this first interval. We catch a bit of a break in the middle because we can plug 0 in. And 0 just gives the top value 10 times 4. And then the bottom value would be negative 4 to the third, which is going to stay negative overall. And we have concave. And I don't know what I'm doing here because this interval is concave down. Let's go back here. This interval should be concave up. I'm just doing that to make sure you're paying attention. Let's recap. I have a positive second derivative. This should be concave up. Now, if we test positive 3, well, guess what? You're going to have something that looks extremely similar to what you had from when you tested negative 3 because you're plugging positive 3 and negative 3 into two particular x's that are both squared. So this is positive, and I promise to get this right this time con up. So the only thing left to do is kind of organize our thoughts, state our answer. We could say that f is con up, and that's going to happen on a pair of different intervals. Those intervals would be negative infinity to negative 2, and once again from 2 to infinity. The reason, as all other times is because f double prime is going to take on positive values on those intervals. All right, next, let's discuss why f has con down. Well, first of all, where it has con down is pretty apparent. We have negative 2 to positive 2. Let's spell this correctly, con down, not down down. <laughs> so con concave down on negative 2 to positive 2 because f double prime is less than 0 on, and I'll just state that interval. And then the POI, well, the POIs are going to occur at x equal to negative 2 and positive 2. Our reasoning is because 
f double prime of x changes signs. A lot of writing. <laughs> that just kind of goes with it. On the AP exam, some of the, the, the most amount of writing that you would tend to do on a free response question will be likely when you justify the existence of a minimum or maximum or a point of inflection. If we take a look at the graph, um, I've got a pretty good looking graph here if you want to take a look. That is x squared plus 1 over x squared minus 4. Let's take a look at what we got. And we notice, whoa, the concavity seems correct. Up, down for a while, and up. But I'm going to disagree about these points of inflection. And I know that I wrote this in error, and I wanted to make sure that we brought a point home. So often, all we need to do is identify when the points of inflection occur. But it's important to understand if they truly are points. In other words, will 2 and negative 2 be part of the domain of this function? And it turns out that because they came from when a second derivative is undefined, it was pretty likely that those same two values won't be where your original function is undefined. So I will always urge my students to throw in those critical points into the original function just to make sure that you would get a, a value, a finite answer output. So I am going to amend this last statement. And it would be nice if we would have seen that a little bit sooner. So I want to make sure that you're aware of that going forward. So the answer would just be no points of inflection, which is a lot easier to write. And, you know, it's nice that we did have a chance to look at the graph because otherwise, if we didn't have that file away in our mind to check those values, we would have probably missed that. So this is a particular graph that does have some change in concavity, but no points of inflection. Definitely a challenging function to take a look at. Join us for our next video. As always, thanks for watching.